Uh, welcome back to the course on uh, computer network and internet protocol. So, we are looking into the IPv4 addressing schemes in details. So, now we will look into a specific problems in uh, IPv4 addressing and uh, network layer protocol using IPv4 and we will look a possible solution about uh, how we are actually mitigating that problem in the current internet. So, the concept that uh, we are going to discuss today it is called uh, network address translation or NAT which is actually a widely used concept uh, which is used nowadays for uh, almost all the institute network. Uh, so, the problem uh, which we have with um, IPv4 addressing is that the number of IPv4 address that we have they are very limited. So, if you look into the address space uh, which are there. So, this uh, address space we have primarily class A, class B, class C, these three sets of uh, or three classes of IP address and uh, then class D IP address is for the multicast data transfer and uh, class E IP address is for the reserved category. So, we are not able to use this uh, class E IP address uh, for our general internet data transfer. Whereas, class D data address because they are designated for uh, multicast data delivery in today's internet um, multicast are actually rarely used, it is not uh, used widely uh, for data transfer. So, the address space that are reserved for the multicast data delivery, we cannot use it for the normal data transfer, but that is actually uh, being wasted or remaining uh, underutilized. So, the three address, three classes of address that we have, uh, this class A, class B and class C, from class A, class A, class B, uh, B or class C address we have to allocate the address. Well, what we can maximum do? We can apply the concept of classless addressing or CIDR to combining multiple classes together or to break a single class into multiple subnets and then assign the address space to individual subnets. But um, broadly, if you just think of that the total number of available addresses that we have for uh, combining class A, class B and class C. Uh, although IP address is 32 bit, we are not getting 2 to the power 32 different number of addresses. Uh, we are only utilizing class A, class B, class C, but inside also class th these three classes, we have this broadcast addresses, then this network addresses. So, for every individual uh, class A, class B or class C network, we are not able to use those broadcast address and the network address uh, to assign to a host. So, this further limits the number of available addresses that we have uh, in the internet. And uh, with this limitation, uh, if you just think of the number of devices that we have nowadays uh, that require an IP address, it is significantly getting boosted up. So, it is uh, increased uh, quite a few hundred fold from the time when IP was first introduced. So, uh, if you think about the number of IP addresses that we actually require is again not equal to the number of devices that we have. Uh, many of the devices that we have nowadays, they have multiple network interfaces and actually we require one IP address for every individual interfaces. And because of that, we again uh, require further more number of IP addresses uh, from the available address space. So, that is the major problem uh, with uh, IPv4 addressing scheme that the number of address space that we have it is limited and the uh, number of devices that is the networking equipment that we have they are increasing exponentially. And the large number of uh, addresses they are either wasted or remaining underutilized uh, like the class D or class C IP addresses. So, what can be a possible solution? So, a possible solution is that if we can make the address reusable. So, ideally IP addresses are not uh, developed to support uh, uh, reusability because every individual device or every individual networking equipment with a network interface card should be uniquely identified in the network. Uh, now, the question comes that uh, how will you apply this reusability? Here also we apply the concept from our normal day to day life. Say my name is Sandeep Chakraborty, it is not necessary that uh, in world I am the only person who are having the name Sandeep Chakraborty. So, how do we actually disambiguate two persons so, whenever we are sending postal mail? So, we see that what is the location of that particular Sandeep Chakraborty? Is it inside IIT Kharagpur or is it say 
inside some other place say uh, IIT XYZ. So, uh, if you want to send a postal mail to Sandeep Chakraborty at IIT Kharagpur, what I have to do? I have to uh, use or address in a way that Sandeep Chakraborty inside IIT Kharagpur or Sandeep Chakraborty inside IIT XYZ. That way you can possibly try to disambiguate between two person, but again if there can be two Sandeep Chakraborty inside IIT Kharagpur, then we want to or will possibly um, uh, disambiguate based on the department and uh, even there are two Sandeep Chakraborty in the department then I uh, do not know how that can be done, but at, at some level we require uniqueness. Uh, so, what we can do possibly that within an organization or within an institute possibly the name that we are using or the addresses the local addresses that we are using uh, that can get reused. So, here uh, by borrowing the similar kind of principle uh, we use the concept of reusability uh, for IP addresses. So, what is the, this reusability for the IP addresses? So, we have certain block of IP addresses which we call as the private IP addresses. Now, this private IP addresses can be reusable. So, the private IP addresses can be put uh, inside IIT Kharagpur and the same block of private IP addresses can be put in IIT Bombay or IIT Kanpur or IIT Hyderabad or any other institute uh, in the globe. Uh, so, that way uh, we will be possibly be able to disambiguate um, between uh, two uh, addresses by looking into whether that address is in IIT Kharagpur address or IIT Bombay address or IIT Hyderabad address or say some Stanford address. So, that concept of reusability we need to bring into the addressing concept, but whenever you are bringing this concept of reusability in the system you still have a problem. The problem is that how will you route that packet or send that packet. Now, to send that packet over the internet ultimately you require an addresses which is unique in the globe. So, uh, what you can possibly do that you can possibly disambiguate the things based on whether it is IIT Kharagpur or IIT Bombay or IIT Delhi. So, you have one uh, address which is unique globally. So, this IIT Kharagpur it is unique globally, IIT Bombay it is unique globally, Stanford it is unique globally. So, that way you first disambiguate whether you need to send a mail to IIT Kharagpur or IIT Delhi or a, um, uh, Stanford. Now, once the mail is reaching there, then you send to the person concerned who is inside that institute, whether it is Sandeep Chakraborty or someone else inside that particular institute. So, we require a notion of publicly available name or publicly available unique address and then the private address inside that organization which can be reused in multiple places. So, what we do in a network address translation on NAT? We divide the available address space into reusable address and non-reusable address. So, the reusable address are the private address and the non-reusable address are the public address which are unique and which are used to send the packets globally. Now, to transfer the packet what you have to do? You need a translation mechanism to translate the internal or the private address to the external or the public address. So, this also hide the internal machines from the external device because the external people now they are not able to see whether the mail is going to Sandeep Chakraborty or the mail is going to uh, Shomoke Ghosh rather they are just seeing that uh, the mail is going to IIT Kharagpur. So, IIT Kharagpur is now becoming the identity the public identity. Now, once it reaches to uh, the local people or the local uh, postal uh, center of IIT Kharagpur, then they disambiguate whether the mail need to be delivered to uh, Sandeep Chakraborty or that need to be delivered to Shomoke Ghosh. That way we basically disambiguate the entire system. So, you allow internet access, you will be able to allow the internet access to a large number of users via few pub public address. Now, here is another interesting factor which is there uh, while we are doing this uh, uh, private to public mapping. The interesting fact is there if you just think about the population of IIT Kharagpur, the number of students or number of faculties, number of staffs who are there inside IIT Kharagpur, not all of them access the internet simultaneously. 
sometimes some uh, uh, students are accessing, sometimes the faculties are accessing or, or there is a bounded number of users who are actually accessing the internet. Now, the users who are accessing the internet at this moment for them I require an IP addresses. The people who are just sleeping uh, for them I do not require an IP address at all. Uh, so, that way if you have a small set of public IP addresses then I can possibly make a dynamic mapping between this private address that I am providing to them with this public IP one of the public IP whenever they are waking up and trying to connect to the internet. Uh, so, that way we can ensure the reusability of the system. Now, if you look into the IPv4 address block, the IPv4 address block gives um, private addresses from individual classes of IP address pool. So, from class A we have uh, 10.0.0.0 to 10.255.255.255 uh, that is the private address range. From class B uh, it is uh, 172.16.0.0 to uh, 172.32.255.255. Uh, from class C uh, it is 192.168.0.0 to 192.168.255.255. So, from individual classes of IP addresses we have taken one block of IP address or few block of blocks of IP addresses and designated them as the private IP address. Now, this is the basic operation of a NAT. So, NAT is nothing but a device a router or a gateway whatever you call it. So, in one side of the NAT we have a private network. So, this is my private network. this is my private network and then I have my public network. Well, now in the private network I have multiple machines who are identified by this private IP addresses. So, this is an internal machine inside the private network you can just think of it as a IIT KGP network say this is IIT KGP network. Uh, in the IIT KGP network one machine is identified by this private IP address 10.0.1.2. Now, whenever this machine want to send a packet to the outside machine say this machine and this machine has a public address of 213.168.112.3 uh, you want to send a message. So, what you do uh, you would prepare an IP packet and in that IP packet you have the source IP of 10.0.1.2 the private IP of this machine and the destination is the public IP where you want to send the packet. Now, with this private IP you will not be able to send a uh, send a packet to the outside world to the public network. So, whenever it is coming to the NAT device what the NAT device does it makes a mapping between the private address and the public address. So, this private address of 10.0.1.2 it is mapped to one of the available public address which is 128.143 dot 71 dot 21 and that public address is put to the packet which is going in the public network. Now, the NAT device is replacing this private IP with this public IP and sending the packet. Now, the packet reaches to the destination. Once the destination receives that packet it generates a reply back and in the reply it puts this source IP as the destination IP. Now, with this destination IP this 128.143.71.21 this is an IP which is associated with this NAT device. So, this NAT device is actually having a pool of IP addresses associated with them. So, any packet for, for to those IP addresses will be delivered to that NAT device. So, the packet is delivered to the NAT device when the packet is coming to the NAT device the NAT device is maintaining this NAT table where it has maintained a mapping between the private address and the public address. Now, what it does it finds out that well this public address has given to this machine. So, it replaces the source address this particular destination address uh, with the private address. Now, whenever this packet is coming to the inside network the address uh, the destination address is replaced from the public address to the corresponding private address and with that private address the packet is delivered to this machine. That is the way NAT works. So, now you can see that every individual machine inside that network may have one uh, private IP address and you do not require that many of public IP address because 
all the machines are not getting connected to the internet simultaneously. So, you require a small set of public IP addresses, maybe the number of users who are getting connected to the internet simultaneously. And then whenever a user request send a packet to the NAT, the NAT just make an address translation from a private IP to a public IP, put that information to the, uh, to the local NAT table to the map and then transfer that packet to the outside world. And whenever the packet reaches to the destination machine, the destination machine reply back to you by using that public IP address, the source IP now become the destination IP. So, that packet uh, traverses to the network and reaches to the NAT device. Once the NAT device reaches, re receives that packet, it again look into the NAT table to find out the mapping, the reverse mapping better to say. So, from the reverse mapping, it finds out that well, this particular public IP was given to this machine with the private IP, it make a replacement in the destination IP and send it back uh, to the internal network and the internal network forward that packet to the final destination. Well, so that is the entire operation or the idea of NAT. Now, uh, uh, in NAT, the organization they manages um, the internal private network and the NAT boxes, NAT boxes are nothing but routers, they manage a pool of public IP address uh, for outgoing connection, the NAT boxes they select one of the IP address from its pool and forward the packet from that IP. Now, uh, NAT has multiple interesting use cases apart from supporting more number of users uh, with the help of a limited public IP. One interesting uh, fact is whenever you want to migrate between different ISP. Now, an organization can connect to multiple ISPs for better reliability. So, for example, IIT Kharagpur network is uh, connected to RNET network as well as NKN network. They have multiple um, outgoing network, we call it as a multi-home network. Now, this NAT, it allows a easy interchange between the ISPs by changing the IP address in the NAT boxes. So, whenever you are making a change of the ISP, your public address IP address pool is getting changed. But the internal machines, you do not need to reconfigure the IP address for all the internet, internal machines which are there inside IIT Kharagpur. They are having their fixed uh, private IP address and only a mapping is being done uh, to the corresponding ISP address to which the NAT box which is working like a gateway is currently connected. So, without NAT what you have to do that every internal system address need to be changed to reflect the network IP of the ISP, but uh, here you do not require that the NAT box will take care of that. So, you do not need to make a change into the uh, internal machine. So, here is an example like uh, say initially the NAT device was connected to ISP 1, when it was connected to ISP 1 during that time uh, you are giving the address from a pool of 128.143.71.21, the, now the moment. Uh, this uh, ISP got a failure or something happened and the NAT device gets connected to ISP 2, it start giving address from a different address pool say from 128.195.4.128.0. So, only thing is that the public address gets changed and this public address are managed by the NAT device. But the private IP that 10.0.1.2 which was assigned to this um, particular machine that remains as it is. So, uh, that address do not need to change. So, you do not need to reconfigure every uh, machine independently to reflect um, these changes. Okay. Uh, now, uh, another uh, interesting thing is in NAT is that you can utilize something called IP masquerading. So, what is IP masquerading? It is like that. Uh, you have a single public IP address which you can map to multiple host. Now, how you can do that? You can actually use the port address along with the IP address. So, this um, concept is uh, interesting in the context of uh, uh, in the context of NAT. Uh, so, what you are doing here that uh, uh, so it is it is basically an extension of NAT which is sometimes called as a uh, port based. NAT or PNAT. Now, in PNAT what happens that one, so 
ultimately if you think about the communication, the communications are basically a process to process communication. One process at the source machine is communicating with another process uh, at the destination machine. So, uh, these processes the, are in identified the IP address of the machine plus a port number. Uh, so, these port numbers are used to uniquely identify a process which is running inside a machine. Now, you can use this IP port pair actually uh, 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 together to make this mapping. So, how you can do that? So, let us see one example here. So, this is the thing say assume that uh, one application is running to this machine at port 2001 uh, that has a private IP of 10.0.1.2. There is another machine say this is machine A, this is machine B. In machine B, uh, it is using a different private address 10.0.1.3 and the application is running at port 3020. Now, whenever these packets are going outside and they are trying to communicate to some public machine, same or different, uh, that is uh, immaterial to us. So, whenever these things are uh, being happened during that time, what the NAT device now do? NAT device makes a mapping of this IP port to another IP port. So, what happens here that this particular private IP and the port number is being mapped to a public address and one port. The second private IP and the port is mapped to another public IP and the port. Now, here I can use the same public IP for both the machine because this port number is actually making the differentiation. So, whenever I will get a response, if I am res getting a response at port 2100 of the IP 128.143.71.21, I know that in the reverse mapping that will be mapped to 10.0.1.2 at port 2001. Similarly, if you are receiving a packet at the NAT device at port 4444, from this particular mapping, you know that this IP port pair will be mapped to 10.0.1.3 with uh, port 3020. So, that way now you can support more number of users with a very limited number of IP addresses because anyway you have around uh, 65,000 more than 65,000 different number of ports. If I even uh, remove the reserved port address till you have some uh, uh, port numbers in the order of 10,000 uh, even it is something similar to 50,000 that many different unique port number you have. So, that is why if you have a very few public IP addresses with that very few public IP addresses by making a mapping with uh, IP port pair, you can actually support a large number of users uh, in the private network. And for them you can use the same public IP, but with different port number and the mapping is basically done based on the uh, IP port pair. Okay. So, uh, that is the concept of IP masquerading through which you can support again a large number of users inside the private network. And uh, well, another use case in uh, NAT is that it can help in doing a load balancing of servers. So, uh, balances of load of multiple identical server, uh, they are accessible from a single IP address. So, the NAT box it translate the different incoming connections to different internal IP addresses to balance the load between the server and the internal systems are now configured with private address. So, an example is something like this that uh, whenever you are getting the request, you are getting the request to the same destination IP that means 128.143.71.21 and uh, whenever this uh, particular requests are coming to the NAT device based on the load the NAT device can redirect some of the machines, uh, some of the request to one machine at 10.0.1.2 and some of the request to a different machine at 10.0.1.3. So, that way this same public IP is mapped to multiple private IP and the NAT can do actually the load balancing by distributing the requests to the uh, multiple private IP addresses. Now, you can think of these machines as the web servers and you have two different copies of the web server and whenever the web requests are coming to this particular IP address 128.143.7.21. So, you are making a mapping to one of the private address either 10.0.1.2 or 10.0.1.3 based on the availability and uh, or based on the load balancing principle and then send the request to those uh, particular machine. Now, this is uh, the broad idea of NAT. Now, one limitation of NAT is that 
see you need to so to to have someone from outside to communicate with this particular machine they need to have this particular mapping in the NAT device. So, unless you have this mapping in the NAT device you will not be able to serve a outside request. So, that is why uh, if you are behind the NAT uh, during that time someone from outside will not be able to directly connect to you unless they have the information of the public IP of the NAT box. Uh, so, whenever you are making a connection from inside during that time you are actually allowing the outside machine to get a information about the public IP address through this uh, source destination IP pair. So, assume that this is your NAT boundary and you have the NAT box one machine is there inside and this is the machine at the public domain. So, this is my public domain and this is my private domain. Now, uh, uh, whenever you are sending the packet if the connection is initiated from inside then you have the source IP as a private IP. say 10.0.1.2 and destination IP as a public IP say 202.141.81.3 and whenever the packet is going outside the NAT box is making a change to this source IP source IP to some public IP say uh, 194.3.2.2 and the destination IP as earlier. And then this machine whenever it is receiving this particular message from this IP it came comes to know that well this should be my destination IP the source IP in the request. So, that was the request message the source IP at the request should be the destination IP at the reply. So, it uh, uses destination IP in the reply message it uses the destination IP as this 194.3.2.2 and send that packet back one it comes to NAT then the NAT makes an change makes this destination IP change to this source IP and the packet is uh, forwarded to the internal machine. But if the internal machine is uh, not initiating the connection during that time uh, the life is difficult during that time uh, what you have to do that uh, say this is my internal machine in the private domain and this is a machine at the public domain. Now, in that case here is the NAT box. Now, this public machine does not cannot send a packet to this internal IP of 10.3.some 4.2 uh, it need to know the uh, public IP of the NAT box. So, unless you have a information of the public IP of the NAT box. Uh, this machine in the public domain will not be able to initiate a connection. Now, to solve this problem people use uh, DNS. So, in that uh, case of DNS you have a mapping. So, rather than uh, naming these things the example that I have given as a web server. So, for IIT Kharagpur we have this uh, www.iitkgp in and uh, whenever you are accessing a machine um, with uh, this DNS name the DNS actually has the IP of uh, corresponds to which is mapped to www.itkgp.ac.in say something like 202.141.81.2 uh, and this particular uh, IP is uh, mapped to a IP of the NAT box. So, whenever the request comes, so we have multiple uh, web servers, multiple copies of the web servers based on the load balancing principle it forwards the request to one of the 
machines which are internal to the private network. So, that way by using DNS we sometime uh, resolve this problem whenever we require this kind of load balancing. But in general uh, unless you have the uh, IP of the NAT box you will not be able to initiate a connection from the outside world or from the public world. Uh, you need to initiate the connection from the uh, private network or from the internal network. So, that is uh, all about uh, this uh, concept of network address translation which is actually a very uh, useful mechanism to support large number of nodes with the help of uh, IP version 4. And uh, in the next class we will look into IP version 6, although IP version 6 is uh, not a very successful protocol and uh, uh, although the network design understood uh, long back that IPv6 is required, but till now uh, people are not able to successfully deploy IPv6 globally for every purpose. IPv6 provides more number of address space compared to uh, IPv4 uh, and it has nice mechanism of uh, managing the IP protocol. Although that is not a success, but in many of the places in uh, island wise IPv6 are being used. Recently people are exploring IPv6 for uh, internet of thing communication. So, in the next class we will briefly look into the basic principles of uh, IPv6 protocol and uh, uh, look into the way people are trying to make a mapping or make a compatibility between the IPv4 addressing mechanism and the IPv6 addressing mechanism. Thank you all for attending the class today, see you in the next class.